So uh, you know that we're at the intersection of the Hamas Lineament and the Rio Grande Rift, and that the volcanism at the Valles Caldera is because of that weakness that's gone on for the, the weakness where those two, where the two weaknesses come together, we have continued episodic volcanism for 11 or 13 million years. Next slide. She's slacking here. Oh, oh sorry, sorry. Okay, so we've looked at this geology map before, but we've got more and more mapped on to the area. Um, so we're working up here, and the obsidian sources that are found in the area on, or in the ring fracture, ring, intercaldera, ring fracture domes, Ceratomedio being the first of the ones following the Valles Caldera eruption, and Cerro Toledo with the Rabbit Mountain sources down here. I mean, Rabbit Mountain with the Cerro Toledo rhyolite sources down here um, being another one of the important sources and a little bit up here as well. So next slide. Um, this slide, I don't think we have seen. It does give you a, kind of a, a good feeling for the landscape and how it's formed. Um, and by now, I think you have a pretty good idea. This sequence here was from one of the seminal publications that um, Bob Smith and his colleagues produced in which the Valles Caldera was central to mapping the whole concept of how a caldera functions. Next slide. See how fast we're going? Awesome. All right. We've talked about some of the specific aspects of, of Southwest culture history. This slide just looks at the big picture. And eventually I'll get this all the way worked out, but part of what I'm trying to get across here is the idea that the two most recent periods, the historic period and the ancestral Pueblo period, for which the Southwest is so famous, are just a very short part of the long, deep um, human history in the Southwest. And the uh, archaic, archaic period is especially well represented at the Valles Caldera. Usually when I run these numbers, I actually move this one down more like this and give the archaic a span of more like seven or 8,000 years rather than just 6,000 years. But we have a lot of sites in the caldera, and you, and again, Chris has gone all over a lot of this, and you saw with the points. Now, when you guys were doing points, um, do you remember what what time periods were represented in the points that you were typing out with, with uh, Chris? Come on, you guys are your well, your experts now in Medio, J, Bada. Yeah. Did you have for sure? Okay. Yeah. So you had in Medios and San yeah. Jose's. Yeah, San Jose. Yeah. 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 And we may have only had a couple of these late archaic, probably right about in here, where my sort of modified time scale. I think um, Eden, Jimmy late Allen, paleo. were the late Paleo Indian points mm -hmm. that we had here before. We had you, might have, you might not even have had those in the in the no. batch. Okay, um, but yeah. So, <laughs> but so the archaic period is definitely the longest interval of time in which we had large populations inhabiting North America and the American Southwest. And that's a record that in so many areas has been obliterated by more recent um, uses, and in particular, agricultural uses of landscape. So the Valles Caldera, with that, without the uh, agricultural background, is a singularly um, preserving environment of the archaic period. Next slide. Oh, sorry. No. Oh, you can't go back. There's Jiggy looking cute. See how young she was when she first started working. I did. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. You just turned it weird. She's holding a hammer stone. Oh, okay. Here's another oh, example wow. of a hammer <laughs> stone. Here, and I don't know how much we've really had a chance for you guys to see. Has anyone seen any hammer stones? No. No. My no. gum. Let's find some. We'll pull some out if you look at. That looks it's good. It's an important part of the environment. And we have these really, really dense obsidian quarries. Now we haven't really. You've seen that some on the road, and. Um, well, next time we get back out to the Obsidian Valley site, which I am committed that we will get back out there, um, I'm hoping that we can take an opportunity to get up in the slope behind, and you'll see some of the denture obsidian and some of the fire effects that we'll talk about really briefly tonight. Oh, which reminds me. <laughs> no, we will not look at my box of stuff downstairs because we won't get to you. So <laughs> we'll pull out the box of hand samples tomorrow. Tonight we'll just have slides to whet your appetite. Mm, mm. Okay. Um, oh, yeah. yeah so we've been talking about where obsidian is found in the Hamas Mountains. I apologize; these colors are not probably not showing up very well back there. But this is the more complete oh, yeah. Smith Bailey and Ross map. So Cerro Medio here is one geochemical source. Then the Cerro Toledo rhyolites that are found here. Talked about those quite a bit. And then the third is up in Polvadera, up up at the top, El Rituelos rhyolite, 
Um, all of those are really excellent, high quality, high abundance sources. And then there's some other ones down here that I'll show better over here. Not not quite as well known. Probably don't. Well, they do not. They don't appear in the archaeological record in quite the same abundance. Um, but they are part of the picture. For some very specific kinds of stories, are actually really really important. Um, but these are what I call the big three. Um, next one. All right. And so inside the caldera, certainly the Bias Caldera archaeological record is known for the obsidian quarries um, that you're working at, and that. You know, like I said, we've seen a little bit of it, but we haven't. It's so much harder now to just wander around on the quarries because all of it's been burned. Mm. Um, but the material is, is high quality. Despite the sphere lights you've seen, in between the sphere lights and stuff is really, really good. And it comes in big packages. And like I said, we were in the field the other day. Our, our criteria for big packages, bigger than Tim's head, <laughs> which is he's demonstrating. Yeah. You know, this is the bigger than Tim's head. Mm. Tim has an especially large head. Um, next slide. Um, so we've actually reviewed this. Any questions about where the city is found? You guys are now experts. Mm -hmm. um, next slide. Um, so, why don't you go back one? We'll come back to this in one second. You've seen this already, but it's confusing when I look at that. Okay, so there are two properties of obsidian that make it especially useful for archaeologists. Um, one is that it, um, every single Geological source of obsidian has a distinct, individual, completely identifiable signature. Oh. So no matter where you find an artifact anywhere in the world, you can do um, chemical analyses on it and identify which source it came from. So either of these sources or that third one up above are well mapped. You need to have the sources well, um, not mapped, um, characterized. characterized, yeah. Um, and so with those ones before when we were seeing those kind of dashed lines, those weren't quite as well characterized. These are very well characterized. But keep in mind that all geologic sourcing um, of obsidian material is actually sourcing the magma chamber. If you think about that, it kind of makes sense when you realize mm -hmm. that what we're looking at, mm -hmm. the obsidian is made up of about 75, let's just use round numbers, about 75% silica and then a fair amount of alumina, some iron. Um, those are the main constituents to it. Then you get minor elements and then you get trace elements. Trace elements are, are elements that are less than 0.1%. So they're really showing up in parts per million less than 1,000. So they're just essentially background noise. The chemicals that are essential to it becoming obsidian are represented in larger quantities, and trace elements are completely irrelevant. So what they're doing is they're showing you what's going on in the soup of the magma chamber at the time the eruption occurs. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it stands to reason. Can you go backwards? I think you'll have yeah, to Yeah, I can. Do, how far? Um, there, perfect. Um, this source here is, uh, I can't remember exactly how old it is, but it's more than six million years old. And all of these sources down here are all more than six million years old. These sources, as we know, are how old? 1.4. Right, less than 1.6 at least, and then less than 1.2. So 1.4 okay. and 800, say. Um, and as we talked about out in the field, in geological time, that's just like boom, boom, boom. That's almost the same time. Magma chamber was pretty darn similar between those two. Mm -hmm. Okay, didn't mm -hmm. have to have been, but it was. And that also indicates that the um, crust material that was being pushed up into the chamber was coming from the same source area too, which is kind of cool. So these are, while they're distinguishable, they're extremely similar to each other. And this one up here and these down here are much, much, much more different mm -hmm. because they're from a mm -hmm. totally different time. Mm -hmm. Wasn't there a trace elements that provide the signature? Trace elements provide the signature. Okay. Yep. Irrelevant to the behavior, but really good for the signature. Right, right. Irrelevant to it being glass. So it's things like yttrium, um, I keep thinking plutonium, and that's not right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, I'm not going to be able to tell you. Barium, strontium, mm -hmm. um, iridium, titanium, mm -hmm. um, background stuff. That doesn't really matter. Um, you can actually get some very distinctive char uh, characterization by minor element in, in a well-known region, but if you try and do that over a big, large area like the whole continent of the United States, you won't be able to get a clear outcome. That's a good lead-in for a couple slides later. Why don't you go forward? Forward. Mm -hmm. okay. One more. Okay, so I did a project um, uh, several years ago. See how this is like really out of date, 2007. <laughs> I'm so old. <laughs> I thought that was just like oh. last year, but... 
Um, Phil Eterno and I, my colleague from UNM, um, contacted, we put the word out to archaeologists all over North America asking them to send to us any published or unpublished data on artifacts that they had found that had been geochemically sourced, as I've been talking about, to the Hamas Mountain sources, particularly well, those big three are the one that showed up. And so these dots all represent art artifacts that are or sites that have artifacts that have been sourced back to the Hamas Mountains. So it gives you some kind of an idea of a use area. And uh, you can see that people are using this whole area. Now, this isn't to be confused with where the volcanoes spewed stuff. That's here, here, to there. We're talking about actual artifacts that have ge been geochemically sourced. There was another really amazing study that was done um, that had many, many, many more artifacts than we did, but they didn't use geochemical sourcing. Mm -hmm. They just used visual sourcing. And that is really problematic, and so we can't use that data at all. Um, but this certainly gives an idea, we talked about before, the large uh, ranges that archaic people are using and other people are using, so this kind of tests that. But keep in mind that this is all the different time periods of archaeological sites all together. Mm -hmm. So this is Paleo-Indian sites, archaic sites, Puebloan sites, Plains Village sites, up through the late, late prehistoric. Um, and it doesn't say whether there's a lot or a few. The, obviously, the far away ones, um, this one in Mississippi, and in the handout that you guys have, it shows a little picture of the point, the little dark point that was found there. These are from a late archaic time period. It's the poverty point culture, which is the very first of the mound building cultures. And it's so cool that this stuff is found there. Because um, poverty point folks are renowned for liking pretty interesting things. So they're like quartz crystals and, and um, what's it called when the sap? You have sap that hardens amber. amber. I mean, uh, pieces of jasper, <coughs> um, galena cubes from southern, southeastern Missouri, stuff like that. And in there, you just can imagine them loving the sand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So this isn't at poverty point, but it's a poverty point site. And the dark point is the right shape for that time period. So it, it does seem that it wasn't just mixed in there. It's actually from that. North Dakota was two pieces of debitage, and you guys know what debitage is now, right? Mm -hmm. So two small flakes. That's all it was. Mm -hmm. And you could imagine um, why little, t well, part of the reason why you find this stuff so far out is that even little tiny pieces of obsidian, because of its sharpness, you can think of those bifaces, people carrying those bifaces around in their back pocket, mm -hmm. um, or whatever they had, and um, you know, you can knock a little flake off, and that flake has a good cutting edge. Mm -hmm. So the, the material could move really far because small size doesn't dimin diminish the value of mm -hmm. the material. Mm -hmm. <coughs> um, is is there something called amber obsidian? There may be amber colored obsidians. I'm not really familiar with it. Okay, because I bought something that it was uh, it was a jewelry piece. It was a little pendant, but it had a silver cap on it. Huh. And they, they said it was silver and amber obsidian, and it was clear amber colored. It was quite hard, but I had just never heard of amber. Well, I'll think about it, and maybe I'll get some more description from you later. Was it was it small in size, or thin, well, or was it... about an inch. And it was thick? Uh, it was round. It was maybe a quarter of an inch uh, huh. at the top. I'm not sure what that would be. I mean, um, when you look at uh, glasses that are from systems like Hawaiian volcanism, and we talked about that before, that that's, you know, takes certain circumstances to make glass, but that can be a light color, kind of a washed out looking color. Yeah. So I, no, I don't know what that would be. Amber obsidian. This was a, a real amber color. It wasn't yeah. real light. We can look it up on the web, Your see ball? if we can find a... Mm -hmm. Yeah, was it Schlitzite? No. <laughs> Schlitzite? Yeah. <laughs> No. Um. <laughs> it it's funny. so easy to make you laugh. Yeah. I think that does sound funny. I think so too. <laughs> you know? it's so um, okay, so what do you guys what do you guys think? Um, you know, we're right here, and you can see the stuff is spreading out mm -hmm. to the east, and then kind of yeah. tapering off. Right. And to the west, it just stops Not abruptly. Any all. idea of why yeah. that is? Have we talked about this before? I don't think so. Mountains. What do you think? Why would that be? Um, yes, you have exactly. We are the easternmost source of obsidian, and these folks here—they don't need our stick and obsidian. They got plenty of their, of their own. Thank you. They don't need our stuff. They got. Someday I'll finally make a map that shows sources, but they're boom, 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 all over in the mountainous areas. Mm -hmm. And you can kind of think of why that would be. 
Whereas out here in this area, whoop, none at all. Mm, so it's sure just enough. spreading to the mm. east. Okay, next slide. And all through trade? Well, it's very difficult to tell in the archaeological record how something got there. So sourcing is really good for identifying displacement. We know it was once here before it was an artifact, and we know it's now there. It's the arguments for how it got there and what the context was with it. Trade, direct trade, indirect trade, down the line trade, whether it's just straight transport, um, etc. It's fairly hard to say. So, and that really was beyond the scope of what we were pulling together. So I don't know. Okay. I don't know. But I do know that people were using fairly large areas. So you can go ahead. Yep. Artifacts are found out in the caldera. Um, oh, you can skip this. This was this is something that doesn't really matter for what we're talking about. We've seen the sourcing. Yes. Um, no, this is a uh, this shows uh, t ties in what Chris was saying. This is the blood of order. I apologize. I didn't change it, the order of what we're doing tonight. Um, so this I think you guys well let, let's come back to this in a second. Go on. Yeah. I really want to keep keep going. Who cares about this stuff? Who cares about this stuff? Okay. Yeah, well, just no. tell I'll me tell you about that. Yeah. I actually, we're just, we're, I really just want to talk about obsidian tonight, so we keep going. And we'll almost, talk about this another time. A few thousand sets. We can keep going. We saw field houses already out there. Hmm. Oh, we've gone. Oh, we've gone. Oh, we've, we've already seen this before. Yeah. You guys have seen this. This can too. Through it. You can skip this. You can skip this. What I really want is obsidian hydration dating. So I hope there is one coming up. Okay. Um, this is interesting. We, we've hinted at this, but just to review it again. So this slide doesn't show the um, Thompson Ridge fire. This is from just before the Thompson Ridge fire that I was using in this presentation. Um, but what it does show you is that with the exception of these little weirdo sources out here, over 90% of the obsidian cores in the Hamas Mountains have burned. So the effect of fire on obsidian matters. As archaeologists mm -hmm. today, we need to be able to take into account the effect of these fires. Some of the quarries have burned several times. The Domery quarries have burned, um, well, there's the ones over here in La Mesa fire, over here in Dome fire, and then Las Conchas on top of that. So Cerro Grande didn't burn any quarries. What? Cerro Grande fire, yeah, go ahead. Okay. Yes, I know. I think maybe the slide I thought was in there isn't there. Um, but can we see? Do you want some more? I can yeah, on. I got a really cool slide that shows you of say hydration game. But maybe it's another one. If it is, I'm gonna stop worrying about it. That's why. So oh there it is. Yay. Magic. <laughs> I don't know how that happened, but I'm happy with it. Okay. So the two oh, magical man. things about obsidian. The first is obsidian sourcing, so we can tie it back to the source, and the second is obsidian hydration dating. So obsidian hydration dating, the basic principle of it, who in here knows how it works? You well, know I how it works. Try, so. Larry knows how it works. Okay. I can make some I know. <laughs> I, no, I will. I'll do it for you. Okay. okay. Um, <laughs> so say hydration dating works because when you have a fresh surface of glass, like when you're napping it, then um, it will slowly, after that, begin to absorb water. And it does that really, really slowly. So if you have several hundred years of, of time since that surface was created, you'll have a few microns thick. So the way that you do it is you take the artifact, you take little cuts out, and then polish those down, and you view them under polarized light. That's what's showing here. Oh, I see. Oh, um, yeah. And I'm going to make sure I'm saying it right. Yes, OK. This is the, uh, this is the piece of glass here. Mm -hmm. And this is the edge of the glass, and this is the hydration rod. Oh, okay. That's in there. Mm. Yeah, yeah, okay. okay. So all things being equal, and of course that's the tricky part, all things being equal, um, mm -hmm. two artifacts that have been in the same environment, one for 5,000 years and one for 500 years, the 5,000 year artifact will have more than the 500 year mm -hmm. old artifact. That's the basic premise. Yeah. Linear or not linear? Um, good question. It appears to be not linear. Um, and if you think about it, you're dealing with a density phenomenon, so it shouldn't be linear. You don't, you're, something is not, well, it's the, so what's happening? No. Crap. I do need something. Heather, will you do me a favor? I do need the box. It's downstairs by the back door on top of the orange bucket. Okay. And if you can just bring the whole box up there, there's one thing in there I'll show folks, but I won't show you fire effects. 
It kills me. Because um, that would just appear way too long. It might. Um, so, yeah, so basically what's happening is that the silica dioxide molecular structure is accepting in hydrogen and mm -hmm. oxygen mm -hmm. with water mm -hmm. into the, the glass. So it's swelling up. Mm -hmm. Which is why under polarized light, there is see it. Yeah, yeah. a difference between them. And then if you, in a, in a slightly better version of this picture, this isn't so great, it's actually this point right here, there's a, that there's a, a strain mm -hmm. between the fatter glass and the skinnier glass, the wetter glass and the drier glass. Mm -hmm. So the, all things being equal is the big difficult thing. Because first off, if those two artifacts at the site aren't of, from the same source, then they won't necessarily hydrate at the same rate. Mm -hmm. Theoretically, mm -hmm. some, uh, artifacts from the same geological source in obsidian will hydrate at approximately the same rate. Um, secondly, the temperature that the artifacts existed in during that whole time will, will make a big difference. So it's a relative measurement. Exactly. So, so when you're starting off building it up, first off, it's a re relative measurement. If you continue to do a lot of homework, then you can start to put together an equation that will allow you to essentially estimate an absolute date. But that second stage rarely happens well. And only in a few regions of the country is that is that happening. So, you know. uh, wouldn't you find the difference if the artifact were sitting on the surface of the dirt or at the bottom of the stream? Yes. Yes. So sitting on the surface, solar gain will have a tremendous effect. Mm -hmm. What temperature it's at generally, so buried, is going to have not only a constant um, vapor or moisture environment, mm -hmm. it's also going to have a constant temperature. Things are lying on the surface, yes. hot, cold, hot, cold, hot, cold, seasonally, and in the course of the day. Okay, so there's a lot more fluctuation on the surface. Doesn't mean you can't work on the surface, but it does mean you have to work a little bit harder at it. This piece here I'm going to pass, I guess I'll, I'll leave it in the box, but, but I encourage you to pick it up because, well, so what is this? Does anyone recognize it from a far distance point? Mm -hmm. This is an Apache tear, and this is how Apache tear is formed. It, it goes back in there. Okay, somehow mm -hmm. it just fell out like a couple weeks ago. Um, so what happens is, a little bit, this will be a little bit clearer when you pass around a little bit closer. Mm -hmm. You have a big piece of obsidian, mm -hmm. and it hydrates, and it mm -hmm. hydrates, mm -hmm. and it's, it's like it's, it's, it's too much water okay. in it, it mm -hmm. falls off. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And that keeps going, this twitchy hand thing. Mm -hmm. That's a little bitsy, itsy bitsy thing, and the patchy tear is what's left. Hmm. Okay. So it passes around. So what you have, the surrounding hydrated obsidian, does anyone know what that's called? you know what that's called, Larry? Perlite. Perlite. Who said that? Ha, uh, right. The geologist. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know about that. <laughs> so perlite is hydrated obsidian. And perlite is put into an oven and popped like popcorn, and then those little glassy sponge things are put into your potting soil mm -hmm. to retain moisture. So keep that in mind when you imagine what happens in the obsidian quarry when a forest fire goes over it. Oh, this is cute. Which I'm not going to show you because it would kill me. Um, so pass that around. But that, that's a real good illustration of, of how hydration happens. So obsidian hydration okay? over a long period of time um, results in perlite over archaeological periods of time um, results in these dateable layer. So I'm just about done now, but to say, okay, there's a lot that goes on in making of same hydration dating work. Um, and it only works in some regions, and certainly only in those regions where people have invested a lot of energy and time, like in California, where there's a lot of obsidian, and along the West Coast, California and along the West Coast, there's two things going on. One, there's a lot of obsidian, and two, the other dating methods are not particularly available there. Um, whereas you come here to the southwest, we've got pottery, we've got really good preservation, so we've got dendrochronology, we've got good preservation, so we have uh, lots of, of organic remains for um, uh, radiocarbon dating. We also have architecture you can use to cross-date mm -hmm. with, and we have archaeometric dating, all a whole suite of dating, and basically, people here do not use obsidian hydration dating. And they think obsidian hydration dating is, it, at best, lame, and at worst, a scam. Okay. 
Um, like Bigfoot. Wait, I'm making the connections here. No. Mm. So what what makes this so one of the um, explicit research agendas here at the Bias Caldera is addressing issues related to obsidian hydration and obsidian sourcing methodology, looking to see whether or not this is a place where we can test the effectiveness of obsidian hydration. Because um, I'm, not a I'm out of time now, so I'm going to stop, but it's an extraordinary environment to work. Not only do we have all these different sources that we can um, look at, we also have here in the caldera a very unusual environment with each of these domes. I think I was talking with some folks about this mm -hmm. out in the field. Mm -hmm. With the domes, we have not only elevational grades as you go up and down the, the domes, we also have different aspects around each of these different domes. So that issue of solar rate, solar gain, mm -hmm. can be, we can examine that. We can look at the different environments. We can look at different temperatures, different um, exposed versus unexposed environments, and we can test that out. And most importantly, all the obsidian that occurs here that we're looking at also is found in huge abundance at all of these extremely well-dated sites where they didn't use obsidian data, hydration data. So we can actually test that out. And best of all, there is no famous white man who built his entire career on anything related to obsidian hydration data. But someone like me can come along and do something different without getting in lots of trouble. Sounds very nice. Not being an old dead white guy myself. Um, you know, it's, it's, but seriously, it's an environment that the fact that it has not been used for all these years makes it a really good environment in which to test it and to see if we can make it work. Go to the next slide. There might be one more hydration slide. I don't think so. And one okay. more thing that's awesome about it, the dates are really cheap. It's cheap yes. to get somebody to measure this oh, yeah. stuff. Yeah. It costs uh -huh. over 600 bucks for a single radiocarbon date, yeah. and you can get these measurements for about $10 a piece. Oh, that's yes. really so, good. So $10 and that's $15. Yeah. And mm. so this is a project we've been working on for a long time. But yeah, to, to go right to the heart of it, I, I didn't say it. I should meant to say it before I didn't. Why would you bother with all of that? Well, here in the Vias Caldera, the obvious reason is we've got quarries, and how the hell else are we going to date these quarries, right? We know people have been using this place for a long time. How are we going to sort this out? How are we going to make se sense of the artifacts that were found in, in, the, in the units you guys have been digging? Scott's going to talk about that more specifically. But obsidian hydration dating is unusual in that you are directly dating a stone artifact. Okay? As so that's artifact, really as a, neat. Yeah. You're not dating the heart that was found near. You're not dating the pottery that it was found with. You're actually dating that artifact itself. So one of the things that we've done to address this, this is a project that we started a couple years back, and it's one that Heather is now leading, is all the artifacts that we've ever found, all the diagnostic artifacts that we ever found, diagnostic in the sense that Chris told you all about, and that you guys did that exercise and, and, and typing yourself. Mm -hmm. We then do obsidian hydration, um, dating on them, and we do oh, sourcing. And what we're doing is, this is the first step you take when you're going to build obsidian hydration dating chronology for a region. So we treat the bias caldera as a region and build this, this source data. Now, in an ideal world, and maybe someday in the future, I can hope, when I show this slide, those blue bars are how deep the hydration is. Yeah, yeah. I these are older, ignore, oh, no, yeah, the, these are the oldest, and they get younger as you go up towards the top. Ideally, yeah. these would be big... Yeah, and they're so small. small, exactly, mm -hmm. that's not like And it doesn't look like that, well, there's a couple different reasons, but a really big one, can mm -hmm. you even guess why it doesn't look like that, the really big reason? Mm -hmm. These are at least three different sources that are mm -hmm. shown here. We don't mm -hmm. have them separated by oh, source. Okay, okay. If you can see really closely, you see this yellow, pink, green, that would sort it out. We just need more sample size. So all the time when we're out surveying, we're collecting these points and adding it in, and I think that... When we get done with this last batch, well, it's 250 some, right? For how many points we'll have? Mm -hmm. Which is starting to get there. And the last time we did analysis, this is a project that oh, I started with Jeremy Decker some years ago. We got some really interesting differences across the landscape that we're hoping to continue to, to play out.